Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Gary Matsuoka, and this is Laguna Hills Nursery in Santa Ana. Today is our most important class that we do. We do this class every season. So you might have, you know, there's a lot of versions of this on YouTube. Now, for the first time, I actually watched one of my former classes just to see what I was doing. And it turns out that the year and a half I spent down in Texas has really influenced the way I speak. <laughs> so, especially at the start of the class, I'm talking slow and take, it takes a while for me to get my thoughts in down. Um, so I'll try to speed up at the beginning. <laughs> so today's class um, is our most important one because um, our industry has gone astray uh, in the fact that they're trying to grow plants in compost. And this is extremely serious because most plants, the last thing they want to grow is in ground up dead rock trees. Virtually every grower, and every major grower we can think of, uh, is trying to follow the lead of academia, saying that, you know, because they, they found out, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, the compost or dead organic matter is a critical part of the system that plants live in. They have to have that as a nutrient source, yet it's not dirt. It's not for the roots of the plants live. So one of the things we should talk about is what do plants need? Let's take a typical say, tree. <clears throat> and you know, and, uh, back when I was a kid or back in junior high school and high school, they always showed the tree with roots being a mirror image of the top of the tree. Well, no, it's not. Uh, root systems of trees tend to look like this. There's no such thing as a tap root in nature. No one's seen it unless you live, you know, unless the tree is living in a deep gorge that's filled with rocks. Uh, then the roots can go straight down. But in general, in the landscape, uh, especially in cities, we're talking about the top 12 inches of soil is as deep as they go, but they go three to 20 times wider than the tree is tall. So the roots go way out, tree goes up. So what the roots need from the dirt, the most important thing is, one is moisture, and that's intuitive. That's right. Um, if you have a plant in full leaf, and there's no moisture around the roots, and it's sunny day, the plant may have, you know, like, a typical Southern California day where the humidity is lower than 50%, the tree may totally be dead in less than half a day just because the roots need that moisture around the roots. So, uh, you know, the most of the plant is covered in wax and there's little holes that open now and then to let the carbon dioxide in so they can do the photosynthesis, like the oxygen and the water vapor out. Then, fortunately, it leaves the water vapor through the holes and the leaves when they open them to get the carbon dioxide in. But most of the plants covered in wax, the roots aren't, they have to absorb the moisture. So if the soil is totally dry, they're in trouble. So the first most important role of the soil is to provide moisture around the roots. Two, I'm gonna put down oxygen. They call it gas exchange, but the I'm roots of plants. Just keeps um, <laughs> so the green of the parts of the plant, the chloroplasts in the leaves and the green stems, they're the ones that actually change the carbon dioxide and water that they have in, by the energy of the sun into oxygen and sugar. That's the result of the photosynthesis. You make sugar and oxygen when you photosynthesize. Um, so the leaves get plenty of oxygen because they're making oxygen right there. All the other processes in the plant grow, uh, fighting diseases, closing wounds, all that stuff requires the use of oxygen. Uh, so they burn their sugar and burn oxygen to create uh, energy for the plant. The roots themselves, um, unfortunately, the plant doesn't have a circulatory system like we do. We, we have blood, we breathe in through our lungs. The blood circulates the oxygen around to all the little cells in our body. You know, we can get some through our skin. But in a plant, it's got to go out of the leaves, into the air, through the soil, to the roots. 
Now roots are buried. I mean, if you buried us, we'd be dead in what, 10 minutes. Uh, plants, roots don't need as much oxygen as animals do. They're much slower. Uh, they're all the systems grow are much at uh, occur at a slower rate, so they don't need as much oxygen. Plants can generally hold their breath for two days before the roots start suffering from lack of oxygen. The most sensitive plants, two days is it. Uh, I'm sure there's some plants that go a lot longer and when they're dormant, they go way longer than that. So, uh, but oxygen is important. Now, certainly we know like moisture, there's some plants that can get by with a lot drier soil than others. So it turns out that a lot of the native stuff uh, can suck on the ground really hard with a lot of force to pull that water out of the soil. Whereas things from, you know, say that live in bogs probably don't have that ability to suck water out of dry soil. Um, so there's certainly plants that are considered more, quote, drought tolerant or you know, use less, need less moisture in the ground to survive than others. Oxygen, same thing. So we divide this table up into the plants that don't need as much on this side, plants that need a little, lot more oxygen to soil on this side, the ones we know of. Um, I mean, the books mention the low oxygen plants, and those are the ones you usually see growing successfully in people's yards. So conifers is one, which include cypress, pines, junipers, um, palms, and then uh, the daisy family. You see, everybody can go daisies. Roses are on that list. Uh, Bird of Paradise, not a very common plant over the whole US, but they did show in the book, Bird of Paradise uh, needs very little oxygen around the roots, can get by with low oxygen levels, and most grasses can too. So when you look at people's yards, you see a lot of those things that are doing quite well. Uh, by experiment, we know, you know succulents don't need a lot of roots to survive because their their pores are mostly closed. So succulents are okay, low oxygen. Uh, by experience, we know that lilies in general they can live in almost pure sewage, uh, low oxygen levels and do well. And a lot of experiments have shown in patients. You get by in real bad soil. So those are the ones that, oh, you know, you know, and also by experience, no one ever seems to kill, uh, we never see privet rot. So there's a certain number of common landscape plants that are, uh, that can get by with low oxygen. Whereas the ones that need more oxygen uh, on this side seem to rot really easily so low oxygen levels you don't have your oxygen level drops low the root rot diseases are promoted you know, extremely promoted on those um the most sensitive plants we see english lavender uh, a lot of the natives so uh, white sage i mean this thing rots so easily if the oxygen levels are low this native California lilac to see an opus. You see a lot of these fail in the landscapes. Gardenias, plants on the wrong side. I'm going plant spikuses on this side. Um, pansies have that problem. They tend to rot real easily too. Mm -hmm. And so do these bog plants. You know, it's, they, they live in the water. Uh, but low oxygen in the water can cause a lot of trouble. So, the number two, the soil has got to provide access to oxygen. Now, moisture retention in the soil is known as its porosity. That's a good thing to know. How porous the soil is means how much water it can hold. We see it, it this used wrong in literature all the time. They say, oh, clay pots are porous, they breathe better. All clay pots are porous. They hold water. I mean, the water they absorb water well. They also breathe better than plastic does, but 
That's a different term. That's the permeability. That's the ability to transfer air through the soil. Um, number three, insulation. Roofs operate, you know, uh, operating plant, the roof temperature's got to be, you know, between, it's got to be above freezing. And, you know, in most areas of the U.S., the ground doesn't freeze unless you go to Alaska. Uh, um, so the soil is always above freezing. And roofs tolerate up to around 90 degrees. They don't like it much above 90. So insulation is extremely important. Number four is stability. Got to hold the plant upright so it doesn't fall over. We've taken nutrition out of there. Um, the nutrition is is a different part of the ecosystem for most plants, not all plants, but most plants. So in nature, um, you have the soil here where the roots live. There's usually a pile of dead stuff on top of the ground where plants live. They can be real thin, like in the desert, might be very low. In some forests, you can be five foot deep, but this is a pile of dead leaves, animal manures, everything else that falls around the dead. And that's the nutrient source where the plants' roots are down here. So what we didn't know is how the nutrients got from there to there. And in the 70s, I guess it was started in the 60s, 70s, they had electron microscopes. They actually found out that 80% of what they thought were the plant's roots were a fungus. They didn't, they couldn't tell that these fine things that were attached to the tree's roots were not the tree's roots. Turns out the 80% of the entire root area of a tree is actually a fungus that's attached to it. Um, it's called a, so I think they said about 95% of all plant species have this, um, what do you call it, a um, symbiotic partner. The micro, micro fungus. Karen, when plants first emerged from the oceans onto the land, uh, they had trouble eating the rock, so this fungus could do it. So they partnered up with the fungus. When the fungus uh, attached to the tree gets the sugars that the tree makes in photosynthesis, or the plant makes in photosynthesis, um, the bodies of the fungus are mostly cellulose, which is the body of the tree is mostly cellulose, which is, you know, like this wood here. Uh, and that's a rearranged sugar molecule. It's rearranged so most things can't eat it. Bacteria can eat it, but that's about it. The only thing that eat uh, wood is bacteria. The only thing that eats wood, beavers, anything that eats silos, cows, you know, the ruminants, they have to have a bacteria in their stomach that digests the silos and they get it, turn it back into sugar. Um, the mycorrhizal fungus attaches to the roots and goes up into these dead things and eats them up, decomposes them, returns the nutrients directly to this tree. And they said that process can take as little as 90 days. Um, so it's pretty fast. So that's how most nutrients recycle. The organic matter is there, but the roots aren't in it. The fungus can live in it. But you know the part of the plant that's in that area is going to be the trunk of the tree or the bark that is resistant to that fungus attack. Um, but any leaves you know that are in this zone can get messed up by that decomposition that's going on in there. So the nutrition is is there on top of the ground. It's not in the ground. Now plants can use. Uh, soluble minerals that are in the ground. <clears throat> so you can use chemical fertilizers to fertilize the plant. They'll still pick it up. But in the long run, it's better to go through the uh, mycorrhizal fungus system. And that uh, that's how most plants need to work. I mean, the plants that don't need it 
Um, most of the weeds that we know of, grass weeds, mustard weeds, they have incredibly uh, complex root systems that have evolved to gather minerals in the soil that they need. And certain weeds live in certain types of soils with certain mineral profiles. So in Orange County, you see a lot of mustard coming up, a lot of different grasses. And once they capture all the nutrients to make their own bodies uh, and they die, then these other plants come in and steal it from the dead stuff on top of the ground. And if you don't offer any more chemical nutrients to the soil, uh, the weeds tend to disappear and you have nothing but uh, non the woody plants, bushes, and trees mm -hmm. growing in that era, perennial growing in the era, rather than the original weeds that started. Those are the weeds are called the pioneer plants. They colonize the soil. Once they create this organic matter, uh, the other plants and the mycorrhizal of fungi steal it. Mm -hmm. sure. So what would kill the fungus? And it and once it dies, is that what causes root rot? Or no. What kills the fungus that's so important? So the mycorrhizal fungus doesn't like to be disturbed. So there is so another. Right. So they're telling the farmers, do not till your soil. Every time you do that, you're wiping out your mycorrhizal fungus, which you need to recycle nutrients. Now, it is true that certain crops farmers grow do not like this mycorrhizal fungus. The uh, cabbage family, Brassaceae, are pioneer plants. They live for you know, rivers and landslides occur where new soil forms, and they don't like this. So if you have, if you're growing <clears throat> broccoli or <clears throat> cauliflower, you want to till your soil, get rid of the mycorrhizal fungus. Um, these plants don't really like it. Grasses don't need it. Some grass, they, some grasses, they can go either way. They can use it. They don't need it. Um, so, and the mycorrhizal fungus is otherwise hurt by too much chemical phosphorus. So if you have a fertilizer, like a lot of gardeners like these 10, 10, 10, 15, 15, 15, you know what? Um, incorrectly, they believe that if the numbers are the same between nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, then it must be better for the plant because the numbers are the same. In nature, it, it, no such thing. I mean, nitrogen is by far the most important mineral of those three. Potassium, next, phosphorus, they need very little. But uh, there's a lot of too much chemical phosphorus in these 10, 10, 10, 15, 15, 15. If you keep using those over and over and over, you eventually wipe out your mycorrhizal fungus. And the mycorrhizal fungus is the best way for plants to get phosphorus. So too much phosphorus kills this plant can get the phosphorus. So uh, we know that Miracle Grow switched their firm around. I guess they were told, you know, they used to sell a product. Well, the original miracle, 15, 30, 15, way more phosphorus than anything else because the plants have a hard time picking that up. But once they found out, well, they're destroying the mycorrhizal fungus, they switched the, the formula around to a better formula that made more sense. But, uh, you know, so don't use chemical fertilizers over and over and over because you can run into the, that same problem with the mycorrhizal fungus. Those would be the numbers that you just want to generally fertilize. Well, if you use anything organic, anything that's dead, it's got roughly the right numbers for a living thing. So a lot of our organic fertilizers, uh, and if it's an organic form of phosphorus, there's no issue. It doesn't dissolve. A lot of things don't dissolve naturally in the soil, so they don't hurt the mycorrhizal. So even if you have pure bone meal, which can be you know, 20, 30 percent phosphorus, it decomposes so slowly that it won't hurt this and it's not in chemical, it's not in a water soluble form. So it's not a big deal. Uh, but um, we were, the Ag Department sent letters to us decades ago saying that the average crop in the U.S. starting a crop ratio of about six to four, which is what, three, one, two, ratio between nitrogen phosphorus and potassium here in the ballpark. Is that why they say if you're in garden, garden, you don't put a um, commercial fertilizers on? Those all this? Well, yeah, you can't wipe out certain things. Um, now, nature, usually the nitrogen is hard to get because it's so volatile. So it's, it's you know, so if you 
if you ever test the ground, you're not going to see any nitrogen at all because the ground can't store it very long. Nitrogen in nature either evaporates as ammonia or leaches through the soil as nitrates. So it's a real temporary thing when you add nitrogen to the soil. It's not very good at storing that. It does store phosphorus and potassium pretty well in natural soil. Once it's there, it stays there a long time. It's off, getting off the subject there. So um, how does soil do this? So the ideal soil that is always talked about is called loam. And in current literature, they, the guys who write, people who write the articles really mess up this term. They say, well, make your soil rich and loamy by adding a lot of compost to it. Uh, makes it turn real dark and rich. Well, the darkness that they're causing is sewer gases, which is not very harmful to plant So they're not doing it right. So loam, here's a sample of sand loam off the farm in Orange County. And this farmer told me that this land they're leasing is the best farmland they've ever leased. And so loam means that the soil contains the three components that make good soil, which are sand, silt, and clay. And so what is soil? So, so the most common mineral in on earth is granite. Nowadays it's granite. Um, uh, mostly silicon dioxide. Um, and silicon dioxide, you know, is what you make glass out of. So granite is actually a big piece of glass. Uh, now the light parts of granite are, you know, when this stuff decomposes or breaks down in nature and grinds itself up, breaks off the mountain, the lighter parts of this rock turn into sand and silt. So if you've got sand particles and silt particles, they are fairly clear underneath the microscope. They're fairly clear, just like a, a piece of glass or, you know, a quartz crystal. The darker specks in here, which be gray or reddish or brownish, depending on what minerals are in there. So the, the, that's called the feldspar. That becomes the clay. So the quartz, the silicon dioxide that's associated with things like aluminum, magnesium, iron, give you the colors of this granite. And then the lighter parts are sand and silt. So when this thing breaks down in the mountain, first you get decomposed granite. Now this came from a place that had a lot of iron apparently, so it's more brownish. Uh, so it's pretty chunky right off the sides of the hills. And once the river gets to it, once it falls into the river, the river churns it up, turns all the particles into more rounded particles, then you get sandy loam. Uh, so sand, silt, and clay from crushed rock. Now there's different soils of the world. I mean, there are areas that are pure gypsum, calcium sulfate, plants still grow in that. There are areas that are basalt, which is a ancient rock that formed when there was no oxygen out, out there. So uh, those don't have the, uh, they're not silicon dioxide because there's no oxygen. This formed after oxygen came on the, into the atmosphere. Apparently they tell us by plants in the ocean. Um, so most of the rocks that are forming now are granite, are associated with granite. So sandy loam, sand, silt, and clay. We all know what sand is. If you magnify it, it's it's actually fairly round. Um, you know, we'll give you the measurements. I mean, you know what sand looks like. You know, the beach, you fall sand. Silt is just a smaller portion, smaller version of sand, about one-tenth the size or smaller. And then clay is flex, is a different shape molecule. So when it's associated with the other minerals like magnesium or iron or uh, I, uh, some of the other ones, uh, aluminum, the clay molecules are really tiny and they're, you can't see clay, individual particles of clay, except by a microscope, but they're flat flakes. They're very flaky, like confetti. Um, so this is what makes up the soil. I have this kind of as a visual aid, but 
to be accurate, the tennis balls, which are the sand, would have to be the size of beach balls. And then you have the silk, the little ping pong balls. And I have lentil seeds here as the clay. Uh, confetti in here would be a, actually a better representation. But the way soil is permeable and breathes is that the gaps between the round particles, relatively round particles of sand and silk. So if you have spheres and in physics, spheres would solid spheres would take up roughly two thirds of the volume. Um, there's gaps between the spheres, and that'd be one third of the volume. So there, that's how the soil can transfer oxygen from the air to the roots is through the holes between them. Now the size of the holes makes a big difference. So sand breathes a lot better because the holes are bigger than silt would. So the gap size makes a big difference on permeability. So gravel is way more you know, permeable than sand and sand is way more permeable than silt. And clay is, is, is not permeable very much at all because it's the, all the spaces around clay are so tiny. So clay doesn't breathe. Now the way these hold on to moisture, I should have used a different color, is that water molecules, so clay is, um, are all soil particles, I don't know why, have a negative charge. And water is an ionic molecule. Water is oxygen and two hydrogens on one side. So one side has a positive charge, one side has a negative charge. So it sticks to any other charged particle. So what happens when you water soil is water sticks to these soil particles in one molecule thick really strongly. Now other water molecules gather around because they're still attracted to it, but they're not as quite as strong as that one layer that's really stuck to it hard. Same thing with silt. And the same thing with clay. And clay, now this can be thousands of molecules thick, so it's only holding a thin layer of water around each particle of sand. Clay can only, you know, they said some clay particles are only 28 molecules thick, and they're still holding a, a layer of water around them. So clay soils hold, you know, soil that's got a lot of clay in it holds way more water than a soil that's very sandy or gravelly. Uh, because there's less surface area on this. You know, every time you make something half the size, uh, half the diameter, you have four times as many particles with, so you're increasing the surface area by, they say, du double the surface area when you half the size of the particle. Uh, you figure out the area of cubes and you do that, it comes out right. Sphere is maybe not quite as good, but every time you make small particles, you make a bigger surface area. So clay has way more surface area. So if you had a foot of sand, dry sand, it would take um, about a half inch of moisture placed on top of that foot of sand to totally cling to all these particles and drip out the bottom. So sand will hold about a half inch of water before it lets it through. Clay, the same amount of clay, a foot of clay, over two inches of water. So clay soils can hold on to a lot more water than sandy soils can. Um, so that's why clay is important to the soil. If it's all sand, it would, you know, it would dry a lot faster. Now, because this, the spaces between the bigger particles is 33% of the volume, this means if your soil contains more than 33% clay, there's no more air gaps. It doesn't take much clay to ruin sandy soil. So, uh, you know, the hills up here, are, we call them sandy clay. There's plenty of sand in it, but there it's about 40% clay, and that fills all the gaps. So that soil does not breathe well. So right here, you know, when rivers pull all that stuff off the hills, the sand doesn't travel in part. It's the heaviest particle in the river, so it, it's deposit first. So everything below these hills in Orange County tends to be really nice soil. That's, that's where this came from, near Tribuco Road in Orange County. 
north of the five freeway. Uh, perfect so but you go past the five toward the 405 and as the rivers slow down as they approach the ocean all the clays deposits so you go down to fountain valley los alamitos and that's it's right along the riverbed and you know where the sand is still being deposited uh most of those other areas are just solid clay out there now what's really interesting is 180 years ago, 150 years ago, before they had modern irrigation, the clay soils were the considered the better soils for farming. This soil, if you didn't have irrigation, this soil you dry in a couple of days you know, after the rain up. And you put some plants in there a couple of days, you gotta water it. You can't do this. You know, they didn't have the technology to irrigate the soil. So back in the 1800s, everybody farmed in Los Alamitos, Fountain Valley, where that soil, after the rains were over, they stayed wet till summer. You actually grow crops in that soil. So that was the rich soil. This was originally called the poor soil because the farmers couldn't do anything with it. Now, this is the soil that farmers want. They just water it. Hey, everything grows like a weed. The more air you can get to the roots, the faster they grow, the more water, the more air and water you can get to the roots of a plant. The more vigorous it grows. So there's less oxygen in the clay soil? Less oxygen, um, less air exchange. So if you have. And a, how is that better for the plants, though? No, it holds, in, the, in that it holds the water. It holds the water. So the water is more vital than the oxygen. So if you can hold the water. Now, generally, even in clay, if there's nothing else in the clay, the oxygen exchange is enough. I mean, the roots will live at a more shallow level in the clay. I mean, in sandy soils, they might go down two feet. In clay soils, they may go down eight inches because that's as far as the air goes. So that's fine. I mean, they just live more shallowly. The problem we have is if you stick compost in the ground, in clay, you're in big trouble <laughs> because this is, this is totally artificial. Compost, this doesn't exist in nature. When a tree dies, that trunk may take centuries to decompose. But what they do is, you know, what our industry does, they take a tree, dead tree, or, you know, the parts that they can't sell for lumber. They grind it all up into teeny little bits. That stuff will decompose in six months. That's way too fast. This, when you break a wood down to, you know, you have a piece of wood and you throw it in a lake, it might take years and years and years, decades. Like they say, the trees that fell into Spirit Lake in Mount St. Helens, they're still there. The logs are still floating in the in the lake. It takes them a long time to decompose in water, but this will decompose in weeks. It's so fast, it's it's using up a lot of oxygen as it decomposes. Now, the claim from compost people, my compost is finished. Now, I can still see it, it's not finished yet. So when compost is totally finished, it becomes carbon dioxide and water. There's a few minerals left, but it's very little left after this stuff decomposes. It's mostly carbon dioxide and water. So this is still decomposing at a slower rate than it did initially when you when you ground up, you know, when you grind up all this dead stuff and pile it up real high, it can actually catch on fire. It's, it's decomposing at such high temperatures. Uh, and then when it slows down a bit, they say, oh, it's finished. Well, it's still there. So you put this in clay, it's using up oxygen really quickly. The plants have trouble getting the oxygen because of this. Now, if this was on top of the soil, it's not going to affect it. You know, and, and as long as it's not too thick, because this is real fine texture, then the oxygen goes through this into the clay and the roots will stay alive. But if this is mixed in with the clay, this is not getting oxygen from the atmosphere very well at all at that point, And it's stealing the oxygen the roots need. That's when you start losing plants as you, you compromise the oxygen supply of the clay by adding this to it. I mean, when my parents moved to Mission Vale in the 60s, before we started growing plants and compost, their yard was solid clay. They planted everything, azaleas, camellias, ferns, um, dichondra, nothing died. Because in those days, that wasn't the practice. We did not overload the soil with compost and we did not grow plants in compost we were still growing them in mostly this stuff and you put that in clay nothing happened nothing goes wrong 
But nowadays they grow plants in primarily in this stuff, ground up bark. And expect it to do well. Now there's a whole story behind it. But let's finish up with this first. So um in a sandy loam soil, the ratios of these numbers are about well that one, they're actually uh, 85%, maybe 8%, and the rest of it is silt. I mean, that soil is almost pure sand when we analyze it. Now, a way to analyze soil somewhat accurately is put in a jar, fill your jar half with, with your soil, add water to the neck, a few drops of soap, shake it up really good, get all the bigger pieces of chunks of dirt to separate into their parts. So you're shaking it for several minutes, then you set it down on your desk, and immediately the sand just settles out. Sand is such a big particle compared to its surface area, or a heavy particle compared to its surface area, just falls down. The silt falls down a little bit later. The clay stays, keeps the water milky overnight, then it settles down by the next morning. And I can see this clay layer on here is less than a quarter inch thick. So maybe 8%, maybe 10 I don't think it's, well, it might be 10% because the clay will filter through the part, you know, that, that's why it's not perfect because the, the silt will filter down slightly into the sand and the clay will filter down slightly into the silt because it's a smaller particle. But it's a good estimation of how bad your soil or how good your soil is. And this is, you know, at least 85% clay. So this is <clears throat> very <clears throat> permeable soil. And the farmers, farmers love it. I mean, we had this strawberry farmer at one of the farmer's markets we were at tell us, well, we got this really fertile farmland near the Santa Ana River. No, it wasn't fertile. It was just sand. <laughs> and, their, and their plants grew so well on it. They still have, you have to feed them but, and water them. But uh, with that, plenty of air supply, ample water supply and fertilizer, they grow really, really well. So um, that's so sandy loam is usually around 60, say uh, 10, and that'd be what 30. Around those ratios, and it can be any, it can be like this. I mean, it, this can have too much clay in there. Anytime you get above 35% clay, you're talking about some type of clay soil. Rich loam would be when the clay is around 20%. They have 20, 20, and uh, 60. That would be a clay loam where it's not too much clay. It's a rich, rich loam. So they have a lot of clay in there, but it's not blocking all the airflow yet. So you can see if you've got like 40% clay and you can't breathe, you can add a little sand to that and it'll breathe. And an egg agent told me, up, yeah, there's no soil in Orange County that's clay enough that if you made it half sand, and you, you add the same amount of sand, it'll breathe. So apparently the clay content doesn't really reach 60%. Orange County is more like 50% or less. So if you increase the sand volume in your soil, then that clay will suddenly, that soil will start breathing for you. So don't listen to people tell you add sand to clay soil, you get concrete. How does that work? You have to add uh, cement to, to, to your soil to make concrete but this will certainly help it breathe better. So you can improve um, soil by adding. Now, you, it's really hard to change clay. I mean, it's almost easier to replace it than to change it, but nature does have one method of making clay breathe better. So if you have a lot of compost on the surface of the ground, as this stuff decomposes, the wood decomposes, the cellulose decomposes. So in plants, the cellulose, which are the walls of the cells of the plant, our, our cells have nitrogen membranes. And so the plants have nitrogen membranes, but they also have cell walls that are made out of cellulose. So the cellulose strands, which are strands of sugar, you know, um, sugar molecules held together, are, are glued together with a, another sugar molecule called lignin, related to sugar called lignin. And ligament is nature's glue that holds the plant together. When the stuff decomposes on the surface, it's still sticky and it goes into the clay and starts binding all these little clay particles into bigger chunks. 
and they call that granulation of the soil aggregation. So if you have a lot of things decomposing on clay, the clay near the surface starts acting like sand particles because they're even glued together by the lignin. So if you put compost over a clay soil uh, and leave it there for a while, this clay soil meeting below it becomes more uh, permeable because of that. So that's how nature works. Uh, the other thing that you know that a lot of the soil experts promote is the mycorrhizal fungi creates a structure in the soil that doesn't move, and then the uh, lignin makes all these chunk soils. And they said the worms in the soil, and most of our worms here are microscopic worms um, that you can't really see. They, as they move through the soil, they create holes through the soil, and all that makes a structure that's not unlike Swiss cheese. And the soil left untouched around plants, even in clay soil, becomes very airy, very permeable. And it's a very sturdy structure as long as you don't start tilling it or adding the wrong fertilizers or throwing compost in it. That soil breathes pretty well, even if it's made out of clay. You're talking about nematodes or microscopic ones? Nematodes would be microscopic ones. That's one time. I mean, there's plenty of organisms that live in the ground besides nematodes that will make holes too. But nematodes are probably the main thing. I mean, they said there's hundreds of millions, hundreds of nematodes in just a little bit of soil. Most of them are good guys, some of them are bad guys. How do you spell the silos and the living? That was your <laughs> so cellulose is a sugar molecule that's rearranged. Lignin is also a sugar molecule that's rearranged by the plant to, for certain purposes. You can buy lignin in liquid form and spray it. It makes your soil beat up into little, little beads after it dries. It glues the soil particle together. So that is sold. Um, but you, know, you just throw dead stuff on the ground, does the same thing eventually. I don't know if this is off topic, but I used to hear, oh, your soil is really heavy, just add some gypsum to it to break it up. Why would you do that? If you, I mean, don't you want that clay? Is, does that make sense? Putting gypsum into the soil? Well, gypsum, well, gypsum doesn't do anything here, so. Uh, certain soils, they call them the sodic soils, they have too much sodium in them. Gypsum helps sodium be released from the soil. And sodium can make the soil a little slimy. And so, so do you find more sodium in clay? You find it near the ocean. Oh, okay. So they said that, you know, so the Ag Department actually sent us letters back in the 80s saying, don't promote gypsum. Now, you know, gypsum won't really fix your clay soil. Uh, all it does is make it less slimy. And that only occurs, they told us, within a few miles of the ocean where the sodium comes in from the ocean water, um, you know, the ocean spray coming in land. They said here, gypsum doesn't do much. Now, we've since learned gypsum's a really important nutrient in trees. Gypsum is a part of wood. So, all, and it's a part of uh, the calcium, which is gypsum's calcium sulfate. Is a vital part of making fruit too. So um, the fruit tree people say, oh, we have to apply gypsum all the time. So we do recommend people apply gypsum and a lot of it because it turns out that in a tree, gypsum is the third most important part of a tree. No, well, Didn't you get that in your mulch? Did you get gypsum in the a mulch? A little bit. Yeah. A little bit, not, not enough to make a difference. Well, you still, well, you need a lot. So, I mean, our soils do have quite a bit of gypsum in them. There's a lot of calcium in the soil, but uh, for some plants, never enough. Yeah. Tomatoes, peppers, avocado trees, uh, apple trees, more gypsum, more calcium is better. So, yeah, that doesn't do much. Um, but, you know, the worst thing that they tell us is turn compost in the ground to make it better. It's like, Mm -hmm. That's absolutely the worst thing you can do to the soil is fill with compost. Because um, the oxygen level is dropped to zero. What is the value of compost? It's the nutrient source for the plants. On top of the soil. Yeah. 
it's the dead leaves on the surface of the plants feed the plants. So, I mean, University of California Davis actually did a study of the Central Valley. They went around the entire Central Valley looking at the different soil types and surveying the plants that grew on them. And they, their conclusion was plant, these plants they were surveying. So they're surveying trees and bushes native to the Central Valley. They said they did not, they were apparently weren't getting anything from the soil. They grew wherever dead leaves piled up. The soil was just there for stability, insulation, water retention, that stuff. But the nutrients, they, you know, they said these soils were so buried in nutrient in their natural nutrients that, you know, the, that they saw the same plants going there. So just don't till it. Don't till your soil, soil. Put a lot of dead stuff on top. And you're. Now the just like nature does. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Now the big problem is is that our plants have been grown in the wrong soil. So that's you know next month I won't have time this month to do the class, but these plants are coming to us in mostly compost nowadays because academia has told the growers. So you know back when I was a kid, all the growers used that. Fine. Back in the sixties, there is no such term as overwatering. You can water that as much as you want. There's no reason for the plants to die. Um, water, as it comes out of the faucet, the water is cast to have five to seven parts per million oxygen content in that water. Because if the water is totally devoid of oxygen, which is unusual in nature, I mean, usually in a lake or a stream or rain, there's plenty of oxygen in the water. They have to have five to seven parts per million by law so that when you irrigate your plants, it doesn't suffocate them. It's like fish, fish in a tank. Um, you put your tap water in the tank, there's enough oxygen in there for the fish, and the water goes through the surface of the water. You know, the oxygen go perm goes through the surface of the water and exchanges with the water, keeps the oxygen level high enough. You throw a handful of compost in the fish tank, that fish will be dead before night. You know, in a few hours, that compost will lower the oxygen level so the fish can't survive in it. So, uh, but the water out of the faucets is fine. This soil doesn't consume any oxygen. The roots of the plants consume it. Um, so, but, you know, as long as the water is fine, the plants are usually fine in the, in the soil. And even in clay soil, they're usually fine. Well, they live closer to the surface where the water, the oxygen will permeate, uh, permeate deep enough for the roots to stay alive in that. But if you've got compost in there, that's that's using up the oxygen and your roots can't live it anymore. So uh, so the worst problem we have nowadays is you get a you know you get one of these plants with compost in it and you put it in sandy soil, nothing usually happens. This breathes well enough to compensate for that. Unless you have a really, you know, you get a tree in a 24-inch box, got this huge block of compost, you stick that in the ground. You might lose that tree because that that big volume of compost in one place underground now, rather than in a wood box that breathes better, no longer gets the airflow it needs. So then you start losing it. But a lot of these plants that we get, they're growing. You know, this is almost this is probably about ninety percent compost in this plant here. Now this is impatient, so it'll make it. So this is uh, pink moss, sawdust. And maybe 12% perlite, which is uh, which is okay, but the rest of that's decomposing. Um, so if I leave that plant in that pot too long, my impatience to live in sludge, so so it'll it'll make it. Um, but a lot of other things, like this pansy here, if I leave this in the pot too long, it'll probably rot out. Because this this grower. You know, they're they're trying to, so the, um, I mean, this is how science operates. So science, your question has to be good to make, to find the right answer. And apparently no one's asked the right question to the research. Well, you know, one of the parts of our business that's gone haywire. Was, so originally back in the 60s, you go to a nursery, the plants were grown right there. And we still do this. We're one of the few grower retail are still around. I mean, we don't grow everything we sell, but we grow a lot of what we sell because we hear what happens in the people's yards. They tell us this thing died. 
You go, okay, we gotta we gotta fix what we sell or do something different. Well, since the 60s, we started getting wholesale growers. So the job of the wholesale nursery is to get that plant grown as fast as it can, as cheaply as it can, out the door to the retailer. Speed is of utmost importance. For us, success in the people's yard is of utmost importance. It's, it's not the same question. It's not. Um, so the growers, no, now growing plants in pots is actually a fairly recent thing the nursery industry has done. Before 1980, the only places in the U.S. that grew plants containers to sell the public, Southern California, or California in general, Southern Texas, and Florida, uh, Southern Florida, where the ground, where it doesn't freeze in the winter. Because if you're in Nevada and you have a plant a container and it's sitting out there at night, it's frozen to death. The roots can't, will freeze in here because it's above the ground. So they can't have plants containers. So over most United States, up until the 80s, plants were grown in the ground. And when someone wanted to buy them, they dug them out, wrapped them in burlap, took them to the homeowner's home, put them back in the ground. There's no problems because they're growing in real dirt. Then they found out in the 80s, well, instead of growing plants in the ground, you can make a hole in your, in your nursery and stick the pot in the ground. And you can overwinter it there. Instead of having to put in a greenhouse, which was too expensive, they can just make holes in their ground, set the pot in the hole in the ground and all freeze. So they went to, unfortunately, they went to California, asked the California nurseries in the 80s, how do you grow plants in containers the quickest? And so the research at that time was telling them, well, work. And it's cheap, too. And it's light. And it's quick, because when, you, when you're using bark, it's coarse and it's light. So you don't need much roots in this to hold it together. Whereas if you grow plants like my dad did in this, there's no way that in a couple months, the roots will knit the sand well enough together so that when someone pulls out a pot, it'll hold. It, it may take quite a bit longer for this to be held by roots than this. We see a lot of plants and growers who pull out a pot, see like two or three roots in there. That's all. That's all they, they put in the pot before they sold it. Um, so anyway, the, you know, the researchers said ground up fir bark. You have to let it decompose because it's too fresh, it's too hot, but you let it decompose for three months. And for the next five months, this is a perfect growing medium for your plant. Eight months later, it becomes a toxic medium because it's breaking down. So when it's fresh like this, it doesn't hold much water because, you know, this piece of wood don't hold much water. But when the plant's real young in this pot, it doesn't use much water. So for them, we've got a lot of airflow in here right now. So it can provide the same thing soil does temporarily. It doesn't hold much water, but it stays moist. Uh, holds a lot of air. So the plants really grow fast in here. Um, but they do know that there's a shelf life. So they said, you know, within the five months of this soil's useful life, you're going to have to either sell the plant, put into fresh bark, or throw it away. And none of those sound good to me. Because, you know, this homeowner takes this plant home in this, this bark continues to decompose. Uh, unless the plant's really tolerant of low oxygen levels, it's going to rot it out. And that's what we discovered in the 1980s and 1990s that, you know, what happened was in the 80s, you know, my dad started, he called up the egg farm. He says, plants are rotting. What am I doing wrong? And he said, you, them, you can't water your plants every day. The water's going to rot them. And that's when you know I, I came back to his business in the in the around 1980. And I told him I, I would I would figure this out for him. It took me quite a while, but we figured it out uh, because he had watered all the plants in this stuff for the previous 30 years every day and never had a problem. And suddenly we were getting plants from other growers. Now, I made the mistake, and I told my dad, it's a waste of time for us to grow plants. 
we can buy them in and sell them and make a lot more money that way. So we started doing that and we started having these rock problems and uh, everybody was starting, was going this route because this is too slow and, and it's too heavy. Now there wasn't, the initial research was better. I mean, they, they told the nursery industry a uh, mixture of, of sand and peat moss would be lighter than this. And peat moss is very, very light, almost has no weight at all. Uh, and, and sand and sandy loam are about the same weight. So if you make it half peat and half sand, now peat moss is something that dies. But the difference between peat moss and this or compost, this died thousands of years ago. And there is no longer a disease reaction with this. It doesn't really promote, and it's not related. So these are reeds that died in Canada. I mean, there's uh, peat bogs throughout Canada, northern United States, uh, and northern Europe. England's got a lot of peat bogs. Siberia's mostly peat bogs. So there's a lot of this around, and it's it's they just mine it, or actually vacuum the lakes uh, to get this off of them. And uh, this stuff is so old that there's no really disease reaction. In fact, they said they used to pack wounds with peat moss because they considered it antiseptic. World War One. Um, so no, no disease issues with this, and it holds water quite well. Um, now clay holds water better. So just so you know, clay holds water better than peat, but it won't let it go. It's stuck to that clay, whereas peat moss lets water go. So that combination is actually pretty good, sand and peat. And we we heard that Cal State Fullerton still does that, that soil mix. Of course, sand is still quite heavy. It's half sand. It's still half as heavy as sand was, which is 100 pounds per cubic foot. So it's still heavy. Um, so they wanted something even lighter than that. So then the universities told them, well, and, and they also want it cheap because peat moss being shipped down from Canada or northern United States is still expensive. They said, okay, let's go third, 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 peat bark and sand. Uh, so that's what they did in the 60s. Uh, now in California, we never used that mix. We had redwood trees here. And redwood is the slowest decomposing wood. So they say it takes seven years to decompose. So my dad and a lot of other nurseries are using redwood sawdust mixed with with uh, sandy loam as a mix. And we didn't have too much trouble because the redwood it was almost inert. Uh, um, and then, but unfortunately by the eighties, all the virgin forests were gone and redwood prices skyrocketed and everybody switched to uh, fir. So in the eighties, we saw all this problem going on because of the fir um and nobody was telling anybody what was going on or what was wrong and uh, i don't know it hasn't ever fixed ever since we've noticed that some growers um are using bigger chunks which take a little longer to decompose <laughs> because they're having so much trouble with rot that they went to bigger pieces like oh boy um, if you were going to take some cuttings, get them to root, you know, put it in the wires and put it rooting down, following and stick it dry, mostly down. What would you do? What would you do? Sand. Just sand. But then don't you have to water it a lot? And here in Southern California, water is pretty Well, um, to start it. Sand holds water pretty well. Now, this sand is too coarse. This is horticulture sand if you just buy wash sand um at our you know hardware store it's got you know a hint of dust in it a little bit more water retention than this stuff would but you put sand in a pot and you water it it doesn't dry out mm. until you know it doesn't it's, there's not much there but it's not drying up there's enough water to start anything a friend of mine was a propagator for farms and he did all his propagation seeds and cuttings in pure sand and they just reused it. They would sterilize it in the furnace to get all the disease and stuff out of it, reuse it over and over and over. But that's what they used. Sand was the original potting soil. Just go what down is the what? Home and get some. 
But what does horticultural sand have that Home Depot sand doesn't? It's I don't know. I don't know if they know what they're doing when they make horticulture sand. It's a real coarse sand. Oh. So I'm not sure what river they're getting this out of. Uh, I mean, most sands are, are got out of the local river beds. So a Home Depot sand around here would be from a, a local river. So you get all colors of sand depending on the river bed. This horticulture sand is from a distributor up north. So this looks to be coming off the Sierra somewhere. It's a real coarse sand. And I'm not a fan. I don't like using this to grow plants and it's it's very coarse and, and it doesn't they don't use the sand from the ocean it's it's salty. Salty. so if you buy clay sand or something like that playground sand or playground sand they call it yeah. so it's a lot or get some stuff out of it yeah but yeah any kind of sand is so my dad's bonsai book so that you know in, in china and japan apparently they were Growing container plants for anyone else, so they were growing plants, and they kept, you know, they expected me in pots for a thousand years. So my dad's bonsai book would say, you know, we start with sand, but sand is too vigorous. We want these plants not to be have big leaves and grow fast. We want them to have small leaves and grow slowly. So they would add a lot of clay to their soil. They gave the formulas for certain plants to use this much clayish soil and this much sand to get those plants growing, but they said, well, if your plant starts rotting and there's too much clay, because everything will shallow pots too. Uh, you take out the pot, put it in pure sand so it recover. So in their book, sand was always the most vigorous growing medium. And when we started doing our own soil testing back in the 90s, found the same thing. You can grow, you know, as long as you fertilize it and you water it, sand grows the prettiest plants imaginable in containers. What you grow here, that you say you sell, what are you doing? Well, what we found out is if you have sand in a container, say this big, that's already about 30 pounds of sand or even 40 pounds of sand, you can't even lift this stuff. So we knew we couldn't sell. So when we did our test, we go, okay, sand works perfect. Can't sell it, can't lift the bag. You know, unless, unless you know, well, most people cannot move sand very easily. And if you put it in a pot, like my dad grew plants in this. And in those days, we rarely sold plants any bigger than five gallon because you couldn't lift them. Yeah. You had a 15 gallon bucket back. Well, we had 24 inch boxes and we used dollies to move them around because they were 300, 400 pounds. Couldn't lift the things. So, so most nursery plants were either in little tiny containers. Uh, we actually had wood things in those days. Um, and uh, we had metal containers in those days. And generally, there was you know, this soil and those wood and those milk containers only filled about two thirds container because it was too heavy to it to the top. So it was just heavy. So we knew we couldn't sell pure sand, even though all our tests showed sand was the perfect medium for growing plants. We couldn't, we knew we couldn't do that. So the lightest version of natural version of um, quartz is pumice. So it's still silicon dioxide, but you know, volcano gases are the natural gas in the ground blow a lot of holes through this. So this is 70% air, 30% rock, even though it's solid pieces, it's very airy. So he said, okay, that's that's pretty good, but this dries out a little too fast, faster than sand does. So we asked the guys at UC Riverside, what what's up with the water? And they told us the peat moss. So he said, oh, no. Here's two opposites. Let's put them together and see what we get. And we got what's called our acid mixed potting soil. Half peat moss and half volcanic rock. And it grows plants really well. I mean, we're amazed. We can grow anything in this. Uh, the problem being 50% peat. Peat's not totally permanent. And it's such a small particle that it, that it tends, this soil that's half and half tends to settle badly. Because peat moss is such a tiny particle, it tends to disappear between the particles of pumice uh, once it's once you start watering a lot plus peat moss um, still decomposes slowly over five six years so the soil volume does drop down so we said well for trees and shrubs and pots we want something a little more permanent so we had to lower the peat moss well this is kind of heavy i mean we used to have a product that was 70 percent this 30 percent this but 70% pumice is pretty heavy in bag still. So 
we decided to go with uh, adding some perlite. We did put a little sand in there because we do like sand in the mix. And we added charcoal. So charcoal has a role in nature as being what makes the rich black soils of the world black. So it's not sewer gas that makes soils black, although sometimes when you're in marshland, you know, or in thick grassland, you get this real black soil. It's because there are sewer gases around the grass when it's tolerated. But uh, in general, the rich black soils in the world, this was an article in National Geographic, and, and even uh, 2000 had a soil article, soil volumes, it was all in soil. They said the rich black soils of the world are rich in black because of a charcoal content of one to two percent. They said for some reason it doesn't take much charcoal to make the soil look really dark. And charcoal is inert; it doesn't break down. It's it's when a uh, wood burns or any cellulose burns with a lack of oxygen. So if you if there's plenty of oxygen, it turns into ash, which is not permanent material at all. Uh, but when it's burned in the absence of oxygen, like near volcanoes, you get a lot of charcoal because that plume of superheated gases comes in, that volcano hits the forest. Those things are incinerated immediately. Not enough oxygen in that, in that volcanic plume. It's all carbon dioxide coming off that volcano. And it all turned to charcoal. So around the volcanoes, you get this nice black dirt that's really rich because charcoal attracts minerals to it like crazy. All the um, nutrients, minerals, and that plants need stick to charcoal. So if you have a wood burning fireplace, don't throw your ash out, throw it in the garden? Well, your ash is not charcoal. And it is highly alkaline in the form of ash, so do use it sparingly. It still has a lot of potassium, and that's, what, that's why uh, ash is sometimes called potash. Because the potassium in the plant ends up in the ash. The charcoal has got a lot of cellulose in it yeah. still that's been transformed into something inedible. So a lot of carbon and hydrogen is, is still in here. But in ash, it's mostly potassium that's left over after everything turns into carbon dioxide water. So anyway, charcoal um, is, you know, they say if you go down to the, to the rainforest in South America or Mexico, uh, you find a little spot in the jungle that's really, really green. And you dig down there and you'll find ancient campfire from thousands or even 10,000, 12,000 years ago because charcoal doesn't ever change. And that, that area of the forest is really rich. So charcoal has that advantage, except, you know, to conventionally make charcoal with a lot of smoke, it's really expensive. Is it, can you use your assets from your fireplace in your garden? It is, but just to be aware, don't put too much in one spot. It's highly alkaline, mm -hmm. which is just sprinkle it on. But yeah, if you have a campfire and you have some charcoal logs, that's really good. Mm -hmm. That's hard to for the inside of a log to burn to ash sometimes mm -hmm. because there's not an option in there. So that's so charcoal is expensive to make. I mean, wholesale this stuff is like seventy dollars per cubic foot. Now they can make it cheaper in other countries where you don't have to worry about the smoke. So a lot of biochar is coming from Vietnam and China because currently over there, no one complains about the smoke. So they like So here they have uh, units, these 20 foot containers. They, they have them set up to make, so farmers can make their own charcoal. So they have to heat it up real high and under anaerobic conditions in that container and then they can make charcoal. Anyway, this is how our top pot's made. Uh, when you look at it, it still looks very white because of all the pumice and perlite in there and the sand. Now we, we like a lot of different ingredients. So one of the problems we have with the single green, like there's a lot of, of companies that use pure peat because their plants grow better because they don't get that disease reaction. The problem with peat is it's, for some reason, it's wet, 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 and suddenly it's bone dry, and plants just wilt down. That doesn't happen in the ground because the ground is made out of so many different types of particles, each one dries out at a different rate. 
So the plant shuts down more gradually if it's in dry dirt than it does in dry, you know, peat moss is sunny wet and then sunny dry, it's real shock to plants. So we don't like to use, we like to use more different materials that have different rates of drying out. So uh, we find that this mix has worked for us quite well uh, for growing plants. Our test plant was gardenia because everybody, everybody's gardenias die. So we said, okay, if we can grow gardenia in this pot for years and years without any issues, we got the right soil. So that was our, our test plant for making our soil. And we have plant living in a pot slightly larger. And this plant was four foot tall, uh, growing in half sun. Uh, we had it in there for like three years. Going, okay, this looks really good. Let's let's use this as our soil mix. Uh, and we can grow anything. And you can grow cactus in here. You can grow ferns in here. I mean, it doesn't really matter. If the soil has all the right properties, any plant will grow. And Is also... Is that your top pot that's in there? Right, top pot. What's the difference? What's the advantage of the acid mix? More peat. Shrinks? I don't understand. Yeah, more peat, more water retention. So mm -hmm. for temporary things, vegetables and flowers, this will stay wetter. Um, for propagation purposes, the ingredients, uh, peat moss and pumice rock are considered sterile. Out of mind, out of the ground, they're considered sterile, whereas sand is not. So we do our propagation, seed starting, um, cutting, growing yeah. in our acidics. Because I've just been using top pot for everything. Yeah. Well, I knew it works. Yeah. But yeah, there's a chance you'll have some trouble with seeds. Yeah. Well, mostly with cuttings uh, in a top pot, just because it's not considered sterile, but, you know, we don't know the source of the sand, and that's the only thing here that's really not sterile. But would you use the acid mix for plants that like a more acid soil? I mean, is that... It is, it is probably more, slightly more acidic. That's 50% peat, this is 35. It's not a huge difference. So the top pot is still acidic. And we grow them, like the blueberries, right? We would still supplement it with the acid. Um, well, we've grown blueberries in as little as 20% peat, as long as the rest was neutral. 20% peat was enough to, mm -hmm. to grow the initial crop. Mm -hmm. But we know over time they'll live longer if there's more peat moss around them. Mm -hmm. But you know, with, with anything, you know, the problem with our, our area here is our tap water, the pH is 8.5. That's done artificially because if it's ground neutral, the metal pipes start dissolving when you run water through it. So our tap water will eventually make any soil alkaline and you have to redo the acidity. So, so that's one advantage of having the peat moss in there mm. to counteract the alkalinity of our tap water too. But you know, during all our doing, we found well, well plants that they say don't need much water. They love water. So all the natives and all these lavenders and the sage, with, they always warn you, don't water them, don't water them. They're going to rot. They don't rot. We water those things every day. They don't rot. They love water. I mean, it's it's a crime that everyone's been told the biggest problem with you is you water too much. When water has nothing to do with it. I mean, if you use our soil, all you have to worry about is keeping them wet enough. If you use that compost soil, you got to worry about being wet enough and dry enough. It's got to be dry enough to let the air back in because if the water, you know, if this stays wet, the water that's in here has no oxygen. The only way you're going to get oxygen in here is if, if the water leaves this. So in that case, it's got to have really good drainage. So they're saying, so drainage and overwatering get, get emphasized too much. Drainage is not important. If there's no compost in the soil, but drainage is real important. If this is your soil, you got to have that. It's got to drain, get that water to drain away, so the air can get back in there, because that water doesn't have anything in it. So, now this is this is kind of fun just to look at. So when this plant's going in, so this company uses, they call it redwood grind. Because the redwood sawdust they were using initially, like my dad used, was too coarse, didn't hold enough water. So here they ground up the redwood so fine that it acts like peat. But, and things will grow in it initially, but 
you know, we usually find rooting rots within six or eight months of that because that redwood's decomposing too fast. The second won't rot, but you can see the color of it versus when we grow the same plants. Wow. So we think the off color uh, can have something to do with the root condition, but also all these fresh materials that are being used like coconut core, bark, redwood, they're all low, all these wood products and bark products are loaded with tannins to prevent bugs and disease from attacking them. And so plants, I don't think plant fruits really like to live in all those tannins, which are chemicals that they make to keep them protected. So all this fresh stuff gives all tannins. Peat moss so old, I don't think there's any tannins left in that. So that makes a prettier plant than the fresh stuff that they're using. I mean, we bought avocados once in a row. He puts them in coconut core. So coconut core decomposes rather slowly too. But boy, the plants are a funny color. This makes anything you grow in it kind of give them, get, get an orange tinge to it. From the tannins. Must be tannins in here, doing something to the plant. I mean, it, it doesn't, doesn't cause root rot, but it makes them strange to come. But eventually, as this breaks down, if it's just this, it'll cause root rot. Is that what's now? Root pain is that no, we, no, because you can fertilize things to put the nutrients in the still. It's got to be some chemical that's in there naturally that's causing that. I mean, they, they, you know, one of the growers warned us about redwood. They said, you don't want to use redwood because of all the tannins in it. And you don't want to use cedar because of all the, they're telling us what things you couldn't use. This was, so, you know, that was one of our bare root tree suppliers because they found that these growers are putting their bare root trees in pots filled with redwood. And they look terrible. And they're using, you know, all these other types of material, organic materials, and they weren't working out very well. So they had to keep changing what they're recommending to for them to use. Now, rice holes are almost pure silica. Not silicon dioxide, but pure silica. So this is actually a good material to grow plants in. This, well, it's really, it's too soft and light, but it is used in place of perlite and a lot of things because it's almost the same material. So this can be used. We asked our, our own uh, uh, soil supplier if they would put this in our mix to make it lighter. They said, no way, this stuff, you open up a bag of it in the warehouse, it just blows over everything. You can't keep it contained, it's too light. Um, now, what's really interesting is I asked these growers if they, you know, we, I, you know, I try to talk to people about their growing mediums and how they can improve them. So I told them, well, you shouldn't be using this soil, you should use what we use. It's a real better plant. And they, so they will to their soil supplier, the soil company makes soil from. They said our soil company won't do it because um, these minerals wear out their grinding machines too fast. Or their blending machines get messed up by these minerals. They would rather use wood. Right. That's our industry. Whatever is the easiest path and the cheapest mm -hmm. and the quickest is what they're doing. Whatever is good for the plants. So, yeah, they're not using this because it messed up their machine. So, I mean, you know, quartz, quartz is one of the hardest materials known. It, it'll eat up metal real fast. So you have to be pretty dedicated to... Uh, put that in the blend. I mean, you know, one of our companies, I think they might, well, the company that makes it for us in bulk, they just mix it with their tractor so, so it's not as bad, but the soil companies that put it in bags, they have these machines that have vats of each material and they just dial it up and it puts in so much amount to the to each uh, batch being made. And I guess those are the machines that can handle the rocks and the, and the, the Quartz as easily, so they try not to do it. But uh, it is kind of a strange thing that's going on with their industry. Um, oh, just so you know, too, there is a material that you can buy that's cheaper in charcoal. It's called humic acids. So humic acids, uh, also known as lunardite, is a charcoal deposit dug out of Texas. 
so associated with coal deposits. So, you know, the coal is apparently bark from trees. Um, and they're tro still trying to explain how all this bark got deposited across the United States into Europe, the same deposit of tree bark, because they can't find anything else but tree bark in coal. <laughs> and it, it got buried real deep and it got overheated and it turned into charcoal. So the coal deposits are similar to charcoal. And, you, and so this is cheaper than this. It's mined out of Texas. You put that in the soil? You can put it in the soil and it'll act like charcoal does. So um, John and Bob sold well, no the nutrition in charcoal. It no. just keeps the it, water and keeps the particles apart. It retain no, it retains all the minerals. So you put charcoal in the filter, water filter, because it collects everything. Yeah. There, any mineral that goes by, it sticks to the I've charcoal. I've never put that in my soil. Yeah. That Not essential. Good? The dead leaves on top work the same way, but charcoal. Once charcoal is in the ground, any mineral that passes by it gets stuck to it. And then the plants have this reserve of minerals stuck to the charcoal pieces. So the rich black soils world has a low volume of charcoal in it uh, and it makes it really rich. And they said all the organisms that live in the ground love to live around charcoal pieces. I remember when I was younger and terrariums were the big thing. They always said put charcoal at the bottom of it. It was better, um, it was better than the potting soil. <laughs> but I always thought it was so that it absorbed any extra moisture, so that it so that your plants you, you can absorb it. But yeah, but it, it's really more. It, it's supposed to be a good growing medium, except that the expense is so high. Yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's permanent. Yeah, yeah. So it, it was better than any of the things we were putting in. Well. Sand would be the best thing to put in a terrarium, yeah. but uh, charcoal is inclined too. So too expensive. Yeah, it's Almost. it's very expensive. Um, yeah, it's like covered everything here. Well, so in Europe, and especially in the Netherlands, uh, Netherlands all greenhouses and and container growing. So they grow everything for you know a lot of the produce in Europe, the flowers, everything in Europe is grown in hot houses in the Netherlands. In containers or in some kind of growing medium. So the government there does a lot of research on potting soils. So I used to get this journal that was from the Netherlands that was translated in English. And they said that all this stuff here, um, let's put these back. So the materials that they used to grow plants in that they determined was best to grow plants in was things like sand in containers and like pumice, perlite, vermiculite, clay pellets. Now, just so you know, um, containers are not like the ground. You have to have a different, you have to have a coarser soil that's more permeable. So, quick little demonstration here. So, soil is like a sponge. And it's like an end of sponge. So the water will transfer from sponge to sponge to sponge through the ground because the soil absorbs water. But in a container, especially a plastic pot, there's no more sponge below it. So the water will sit at what is called the water table. You'll get this perched water table above the bottom container because this sponge has more suction on the water than gravity does. And all soils do that too. If you had sandy loam in a container, the water table, you know, compared to the sponge would be up here. It holds a lot more water than the sponge does. The, the, the finer the particles, the higher the water table. You know, a block of clay, you've seen, you know, when you're in school, a block of clay, it's wet all the way to the top. Mm -hmm. And it won't let it go. It, this, that water table's all the way to the top of this clay. So that's so in containers, you need a coarser soil than you need in the ground because there's nothing sucking the water out of the out of the container. So containers, they have to have coarser soil particles. So they found that sand works, plumbus, perlite, coarsely, more air you can get into the soil, the faster the roots will grow too. So 
the final thing they came up with on the mineral side is clay pellets. Best of both worlds, the clay holds the water, but it, when it's fired into clay pellets, beads, air goes through there real well. So the most expensive crops in the world are growing in clay pellets. So most marijuana farms use this. Because this will grow plants faster than anything else. Now there are other things uh some threw in that block of uh you call it uh rock wool. So they you can form things that look like sponges out of rocks. So you just have to, you know, heat them up real good. You can make it uh you can make you can turn glass into a sponge, you can turn plastic into a sponge-like material. So a lot of plants are grown in these grow blocks, which are either some kind of mineral that's spongy that they've created, or sometimes it's plastic foam. They'll grow plants in that. Now, Europe also invented the pallet and forklift way of moving things around. So they have a lot of wood that gets old and they got to get rid of it. So they said that they spent millions of dollars trying to figure out how to use wood as a growing medium, like we do in the U.S., and they couldn't do it. So they said that the, the problem with wood and bark is that wood and bark are not uniform materials. So one part of your wood may decompose three or ten times faster than the part of the same piece of wood because it's slightly different materials in each part of the wood. So they couldn't tell the farmer how long this medium would last as a growing medium. Because every batch of wood they tried to make soil out of was different. It wouldn't last the right length. So they said on the organic side, um, rice holes probably the best. Rice holes just don't decompose. So they said rice holes are almost equivalent to perlite as far as the farmers are concerned. Peat moss, they know quite well. Peat moss is a fairly uniform, well-known material. Uh, a, uh, there are different grades of peat, but most peat mosses, you can get a plant to live in it for eight, ten months. But, you know, most crops, they're growing three, four months, so it's fine. Coconut core, about the same length of time. But that's it. Um, they said wood bark, they can't make any heads or tails on on the performance of that. Yet all our plants, you know, I would say 95% of the plants in the U.S. have been grown in bark. Now we've heard nurseries complain about the bark. They said, boy, this batch of bark we got was so bad, all our camellias died this year. Like, you know, they don't want to spend the extra money and do and get better materials. But I don't know, our industry got blinders on or something. I, I can't figure out why someone doesn't explain to them. I mean, I've tried. I've talked to the head grower at some of these nationwide nurseries for, uh, for like a half hour on the phone. I can't get anywhere with them. I, you know, I tell them, you know, this stuff is not permanent. So I, I gave up. I, 20 years ago, I said, well, I can't get anywhere with these guys. They tell me that they learned from PhDs how to grow plants and they trust what they learn in school. So I just give up trying to tell them that you know, they're, they're doing something that's screwy, but apparently the, the industry's not fixing itself. Yes. Kids and Silencios and Lumias, they grow really well in like a wood park. Not for very long. But I, I've been thinking in, in pots for years. And, I mean, they, I put, there's some sand in there. Well, it depends. But, so uh, orchid bark and stuff like that, they have to use a better quality bark that lasts longer. Mm -hmm. Some barks, like they grow fast. Bark, right? Well, there's yeah different quality bark. I mean, some of the fur bark, some grades of fur bark last a long time. I mean, but that, in nature, don't they grow more like, you know, on the? You well, bromeliads grow on tree trunks. Tree trunks and orchids grow on tree trunks, yeah. so that's their natural habitat. But it's living; it's not a dead thing. It's it's, it's not decomposing on a tree. Okay. It's alive stuff. Um, yeah, it's kind of strange. Bark is technically dead, but it's not when it's on a tree. Like wood inside a tree. Yeah. There's no circulation there. It's technically it's dead, but it's not. It's not until you make a hole through the tree or kill the tree that that stuff actually starts decomposing. It's kind of, we don't understand plants that well yet, but uh, so it's hard to tell when they're actually dead. But um, like in the old days, I think they had better quality bark because my dad used to grow azaleas 
and pure bark, and they would live in his yard seven years and end up. And we thought, well, that's just the life of an azalea plant. But I remember my uncle had an azalea plant for 50 years in his yard. Um, and that was before we started making our soil. And then after we made our soil, we said, well, yeah, and our soil it lasts indefinitely. But in those days, that was Bandini uh, azalea mix. Azaz would live seven years. So their mix was lasting maybe five or six years. And by the seventh year, the plant was dead. So they had a better quality uh, bark, apparently, in their mix. So they, were, they were using fir bark, peat moss uh, as their mixture. And apparently, their brand of bark anyway, didn't work, though. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so it depends on, the, you know, that's the thing. There's all kinds of barks and all kinds of this and that that it's hard to get a handle on. So in Europe, they, they said, you can't do it here. That's what we use. So... Um, <laughs> So next two weeks, we're going to have classes on special things, but in March, we'll try to continue with this and show you how to fix the plants that you have and how to plant them properly, how to fix your soil properly. That's not till March? Yeah, because next week we're doing avocados. The week after that, we've got blueberries coming in. That's, that's important. If you take your top pot, would it stay to mix that? Not charcoal, but this with it. You have charcoal in it. In in, in your top five right. has charcoal. In it? Five percent charcoal. Oh. More than it has to be, and that makes it more expensive than our acid mix. So acid mix has less charcoal in it. No charcoal. Okay. We just did uh, volcanic rock and peat moss in that. And this one we made as well as we can for what we do. I mean, this bag weighs between thirty-five and forty pounds, depending on how much moisture is in it. So if it was sand, it would be a hundred pounds. So it's you know one third. Uh, it's a little less than half the weight of sand, but uh, it's, it's as heavy as we want to go with it. But we don't really want to go lighter than that. If you dig a hole in the ground to put, let's like, say, an azalea, does it help to put all top part in that hole? What we would rather use the estimates. Why is that? It's more peat moss. Is that is like a Acid quite acidic yeah. and our natural soil here is not is so even not, though it settles down that's not a problem not as big a problem so you know it'll, it'll drop down an inch so you can put this on top after it drops down okay. the roots will grow into it do i have to change my plan come back in march no I, that's <laughs> We have classes on on the YouTube, so yeah. oh, do you? all the classes are on YouTube. Uh, my my computer skills aren't too good. Under, under uh, YouTube, uh, Gary's best garden. Really, it's on our business card. Can't wait. Right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Gary's inside. That's how I heard it. Mean, you your promotion time to go. Yeah, yeah, I saw videos on YouTube. I was like, oh. Yeah, too much. oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> The visual is really